Hello everyone, welcome to our video on epidemiologic study designs, where a study design is defined as a specific plan or protocol for conducting a research study which allows the investigator to translate a conceptual hypothesis into an operational one. We all know disease occurs in patterns within populations, and this reflects the operation of underlying factors. As such, epidemiologic studies aid in identifying such patterns and can be broadly categorized into three, one being your experimental studies, two being your quasi-experimental studies, and three being your observational studies. An example of an experimental study are your clinical trials, something we've discussed in previous videos. Quasi-experimental studies are your community trials, and we'll compare and contrast these briefly. And lastly, your observational studies can be further subcategorized into descriptive versus analytic studies, where descriptive studies characterize the amount and distribution of disease, whereas analytic studies explore the determinants and causes of disease. And here I've pulled up an image that compares and contrasts these three broad categories. Where experimental study designs, again, an example here are your clinical trials. These involve both manipulation of the study factor, so some kind of intervention or maybe a pharmacologic agent being given to study groups, and the study subjects are further randomized. Whereas your quasi-experimental studies, these involve manipulation of the study factor, but without the randomization of study subjects. Again, an example here include community trials that lead to community-based interventions. Lastly, observational study designs involve neither manipulation of a study factor nor randomization of study subjects, hence the name. These are purely observational and there is no experimentation. Your descriptive studies can further be subcategorized into three that we'll briefly define in the next slide. And your analytic studies can also be further subcategorized into three study designs that we'll also go through within this video. And it is further important to note that these observational studies are used when experimental ones are impractical or unethical. So first up, descriptive studies. These portray the occurrence of disease with respect to the characteristics of person, place, and time. Their objectives include to permit evaluation of trends in health and disease and compare among countries and subgroups within countries. They also provide a basis for planning, provision, and evaluation of public health services, as well as helping to identify problems to be studied by analytic methods. And so again, their aim is to characterize the amount and distribution of disease within the population. Very important to note keywords here with amount referring to prevalence rates specifically that these can measure. Distribution, again referring to person, place, and time, who, when, where. With the who component specifically focusing on the type of population involved, dynamic versus fixed, or open versus closed. And so with that being said, there are three types of epidemiologic hypotheses that these studies aim to answer. One being positive declaration or some type of research hypothesis. Two being a negative declaration or a null hypothesis. And three being an implicit question to study an association between variables. And with that said, there are three different study designs in descriptive epidemiology. One being your case reports, which are the simplest category of descriptive studies. These are defined as detailed accounts of cases of disease among individuals with clinical observations of unusual cases. So an example of this would be one single occurrence of methylene chloride poisoning. This is an unusual case and we can write a report on this observing the clinical progression of the disease. Number two, this is as opposed to case series, which are defined as a group of cases, so not a single one, that share similar adverse health outcomes. In this case, an example would be looking at five different cases of something like hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. And number three, perhaps the most common type of descriptive study, are your cross-sectional studies. These are 
defined as surveys of the population to estimate the prevalence of a disease or exposure. And a popular example of this are your national health interview surveys that are sent out to collect data within the population. These consider factors related to disease such as age, sex and or gender, marital status, race and ethnicity, nativity and migration, as well as religion and socioeconomic status. And with that said, next up we have our analytic studies. As previously defined, these are also observational studies and their aim is to explore the determinants and causes of disease in a population, with the keywords here being determinants relating to risk factors and causes relating to an association between variables. These can also be further categorized based on their design setup. One being basic design, an example of this being your cohorts versus case control studies. Two being your hybrid designs with examples being your case cohorts or nested case controls. And three being your incomplete designs with the example of ecologic studies. So next up, we'll go through each of these and define what they are. Number one are ecologic studies. These are defined as using secondary data where the unit of analysis is the group and not the individual. This is important to note. So an example here would be geographic variations in air pollution and mortality within a specific region. Whereas number two, your case control studies, these compare persons with a disease and a control group in order to determine the difference in exposure. An example would here would be studying the association between chili pepper exposure and gastric cancer disease. This is as opposed to number three, your cohort studies. These are perhaps your most basic observational study, most similar to clinical trials, and they're defined as using disease-free individuals, which are selected, and their exposure status is then determined. Example here would be smoking, being your exposure, and risk of acute myocardial infarction being your outcome. So next up, let's go through some selected study designs that are high yield. Starting with our cross-sectional studies, again, these are an observational study design where for each individual, the exposure and outcome are measured at the same time. These are typically classified as descriptive study designs, although some sources do identify these as analytic. Nevertheless, they are observational by nature, whereby they provide a snapshot of the health status of a population at a certain point in time, and they are useful in comparing the prevalence of disease in persons with and without an exposure of interest. Advantages of these include that they are quick, easy, and cheap to perform. They do have the ability to study multiple exposures and outcomes at the same time. They are also good for describing the magnitude and distribution of a health problem. Whereas some disadvantages include that only prevalent cases can be identified rather than incident or new ones. And because of this, these study designs do lack that temporality aspect where exposure and outcome are measured at the same time simultaneously, meaning we do have a chicken or egg dilemma. We do not know if the exposure preceded the outcome or if this was a consequence of disease development. And with that said, measures of frequency that can be used within cross-sectional studies are your prevalence rates, whether it be for outcome or exposure variables, and measures of association are your odds ratio. Our next high yield study design are your prospective cohort studies, although these can also be retrospective in nature. So looking at that top image, where the bottom signifies time moving from the present toward the future. Your study participants are initially selected with an exposure either being present or absent. So these are going to be categorized into two groups, again, based on exposure status. They're going to be followed through time moving forward since this is prospective. If it was retrospective, we would be moving back in time. 
For this purpose, we're moving forward in time and identifying whether or not the health outcome will become present or remain absent. Again, cohort studies are a type of observational study designs. These are the most basic unit. They're very similar to clinical trials, but without that randomization or manipulation. They are defined as using disease-free individuals and determining their exposure status as they are followed over a period of time to compare the incidence of disease. So an advantage here is that you can elucidate a temporal relationship because you can measure incident or new cases. These are efficient for the study of rare exposures and they can examine multiple effects of a single exposure. Disadvantages include that they are not efficient for the study of rare diseases, however. They can also be costly and time consuming, and they often require a large sample size. Also, because we are moving forward in time, there is always a chance for a loss to follow up, which can then affect the validity of your results. Most importantly to note with these study designs is the selection of your exposed population versus your comparison group or your unexposed population. These should both relate to the hypothesis and they should both be geographically defined. For rare exposures, special cohorts are more desirable so that you can more accurately portray disease outcomes. Lastly, measures of frequency used here are your incidence rates, whether they be cumulative or your incidence density. You can also calculate prevalence rate, of course. And as for measures of association, the risk ratio, your relative risk, or your rate ratio, remember all three are interchangeable, may be used here. Our next study design are your case control studies. So looking at the image at the top, where time again is depicted at the bottom, going from the past, moving forward into the present, these tend to be more retrospective in nature where you're looking back in time. So you have your study participants that you've selected, this time based on your health outcome variable, not exposure. So you have cases versus your controls, people with the disease versus people without. And you'll kind of go back in time and determine what were they exposed to or not exposed to that they either did develop the disease or remained absent of disease. Again, these are an observational type of study where participants are recruited based on the disease health outcome and then the levels of the exposure are compared. The selection of which may be the most challenging part. There are three subtypes. These can either be population-based, neighborhood-based, or hospital-based. Advantages here include that they are relatively quick and inexpensive. They are well suited for the evaluation of health outcomes with long incubation periods or rare diseases. Disadvantages include that they are inefficient for the evaluation of rare exposures. So this is the opposite of our cohort study design. Another disadvantage is that if they are not population-based, incidents cannot be determined. Lastly, they are prone to bias compared to other designs specifically selection and recall bias. As far as measures of frequency, case control studies typically use prevalence. Unless they are population-based, you can calculate incidence. And as for measures of association, typically they use odds ratio. Our last study design are our experimental study designs. Looking at the image at the top, these are typically intervention-based. So moving forward in time, you select your study participants, you randomize them, and you get to manipulate the study factor or intervention or treatment, whatever it may be. Moving forward in time, you then determine whether a health outcome is then present or absent. Again, these are randomized clinical or control trials. They are fully experimental using an intervention where the investigator allocates the exposure. These can either target primary prevention or tertiary prevention for therapeutic purposes. 
They do follow participants to document subsequent development of disease, and therefore there are some ethical considerations. As far as advantages go, randomized clinical trials are considered to be the gold standard for epidemiological research. Study groups will be comparable with respect to all variables but the intervention being studied. However, some disadvantages is that they are expensive to conduct. Trends in health behavior may make interventions difficult to test. They do often require large sample size, therefore loss to follow-up. They do have a healthy volunteer effect, therefore minimize effect size. Lastly, generalizability is a big disadvantage. Measures of frequency that can be used here include incidence rates, whether they be cumulative incidence or incidence density, and therefore measures of association are your relative risk, risk ratio, and or rate ratio that may be calculated here. And lastly, the hierarchy of study designs will be discussed. I've pulled up an image below. We're looking at the pyramid moving up will have the highest validity for etiologic inference of these study designs. With observational studies being at the bottom, followed by experimental studies, followed by systematic reviews versus meta-analyses, where a meta-analysis is a study defined as statistically testing multiple research studies to summarize results to obtain an overall estimate of treatment effects, which generally makes meta-analyses more effective in conveying such large information. This is as opposed to systematic reviews, which are defined as research on multiple studies that address the same research question to synthesize knowledge and report summary of findings within one large report. Again, the difference here is that meta-analyses statistically test these studies and summarize, both of which do require the use of a literature review. And this is in order to form a research question. And so now we can go to our black screen of spaced repetition and quiz ourselves over concepts from the video. Number one, true or false, prospective cohort studies do have temporality. The answer here is true. There is a time component established between exposure and outcome variables. Number two, true or false descriptive studies do establish a chronological order of events. This is false, and in fact, this was a disadvantage of descriptive studies where no temporality exists between exposure and outcome variables as they occur simultaneously. Number three, true or false, a literature review aids in forming a research question. This is true. And number four, true or false, matching is used to select controls in case control studies. This is in fact true. Remember, these types of studies are prone to bias, and one such way to reduce confounding is to match in our selection of cases and controls. And with that said, this is an overview of everything that was discussed in the video. Please subscribe below, like and share for additional practice problems identifying different study designs, check out the Public Health Epidemiology textbook with the link in the description of this video.